Thank you, Jesus. We just give God the, the praise for his word this morning, for his prayer, for that song. Aren't you glad that God knows your name? Yes, sir. Aren't you glad that he, he called your name from the outer darkness and, and called you to come into his marvelous light? Aren't you glad that he did not let the enemy keep him from writing your name in the Lamb's book of life? Aren't you glad that he knows your name? I'm glad that he had mercy upon me, called my name. Despite all that I might have been doing or not doing, he still called my name, and I'm thankful for it. I'm grateful to come before you this morning to step in for Sister Valerie to uh, bring the Sunday school word this morning. But as many of you know, I'm coming out of the book of Matthew is my assigned book this morning. And just to give you a little bit of a, a preview of the book of Matthew, my Bible says his parents called him Levi. It was the name of a priest. But Matthew sold out his Jewish culture to collect taxes for the occupying Roman forces. Sometimes we see in this life how saints will sell God out because of money. And that's what initially happened in his life. But in following Jesus, Matthew not only discovered the, the, the Jewish Messiah, but also rejected his sinful lifestyle. When writing this gospel, Matthew made special appeals to the Jews, for that's who this book was written to, calling them to follow the one that the scriptures had promised. During the first two decades of the church, the account of Jesus' life was passed on orally with basic outlines stressed by the apostles when preaching. Soon it became obvious that the authoritative and written accounts were necessary because Matthew, Mark, and Luke all used the common preaching outline and creating written accounts, we call their books the Synoptic Gospels, basically having the same point of view with little differences. Because Matthew's occupation required detailed record keeping, it is not surprising that his gospel contains extended and detailed sermons while an exact date is uncertain, Matthew wrote his account between A.D. 50 and 70. See, Matthew was an eyewitness to the ministry of the Lord Jesus. And he was an evangelist to the Jewish nation. And his purpose and Destiny was to show the Jewish nation that Christ was the one that would fulfill the Old Testament law. He was the promised one. He was the Messiah that they had read of and heard of and had been prophesied of in the Old Testament. And it was his ministry to tell them that the Messiah had come and fulfilled the law that they felt so near and dear to was the law of Moses. But the title of my lesson today is Christ came to fulfill the law. And when you think of the word fulfill, what does that mean? It means to bring to completion, reality, achieve, or realize something desired, promised, predicted. But in, a, in essence, 
to complete something that had been started. But if you'll go with me, our scripture is going to be taken from the book of Matthew, the fifth chapter and the 17th verse. And I'll just read it into your hearing. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one title, tittle, shall in no ways pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments shall teach men so and shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. A couple things that I just want to point out here. And we see it in the world today. Or maybe we have a friend or a family member or some sort of an acquaintance. They believe in the Bible, but they only believe either in the Old Testament or the New Testament, but they don't believe in both. But Jesus is telling us that he came not to destroy the law or, or do away with the Old Testament, but he came to complete it. It's all inclusive. You can't have one without the other. As I was thinking about this and, and trying to put it into uh, a realization or a way that we could try and comprehend what's going on here, he's talking about that you take, for example, yourself. We all have parents, and our parents had parents, and their parents had parents. But would we be in existence today if we did not have parents, can we discount their lives or their families' lives and go on with our life? We would not have any existence without our parental relationships. And that's what Christ is trying to tell us here is that the Old Testament is a part of his heritage and that you cannot believe in him if you don't believe in the old you got to accept him with the old if you're going to walk into the new. And he says in the 20th verse, he says that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. What's he talking about, Pastor? He's talking about that if, you're, if your comprehension of the word is of no greater than the Pharisees and the scribes, of what they thought of the word of God, then you've got no right to enter into the kingdom of heaven because see, they did not receive him as the fulfillment of God's word. And then if we're going to walk in to that marvelous kingdom someday, it's only going to be through the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other way that we can make it into the kingdom. For it is by his grace that we are allowed to even approach the throne of the king. For John 1 and 17 reads, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by the Lord Jesus Christ. His grace, and I think I went over that the last time I had opportunity, God's riches at Christ's expense. See, all those marvelous things that we talk about in heaven, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the benefits of our relationship, they came at Christ's expense. Somebody had to pay the way for us to be able to have participation
justification and grace. For Romans 3 and 23 and 24 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. See, none of us can approach the throne of our own worthiness or righteousness because our righteousness is as filthy rags. But it is through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that we have redemption and we have been given a right and a privilege to approach the throne. See, we have to understand that through Adam, the first man, he brought death to us all. And see, whether we realize it or not, we are cursed with the curse of sin. And the Bible says that the, the, the wages of sin are death. But it is through the Lord Jesus Christ that he has given us the gift of life eternal. If you will read with me in Romans 5 and 12, it tells the story. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. See, I want to tell you that it doesn't matter how good you might think you are. You know, I haven't murdered anybody. I have not robbed anybody. I have not committed adultery. I have not did any of those evil things. It does not matter. You're still guilty of sin. Because see, that, that sin that Adam committed it is a curse that has passed upon the entire human population of ancient, present, and future, and there's no getting away from it. Romans 5 and 13, it says, For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. See, the law actually points it out. It tells you what's right and what's wrong. It tells you when you're obedient. It tells you when you're breaking God's commandments. That's what the law does. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses and even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. See, Adam was the first man and that he was supposed to have kept the promises of God, but he wasn't able to do it. So God created the Lord Jesus, the second Adam, who kept the promise. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto the justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of truth of the gift of righteousness shall reign in one life by Jesus Christ. Therefore, by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came unto all men, unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made 
righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so grace might reign through righteousness and unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. For as I said before, it is by the grace of God that we have the gift of eternal life. For we are justified by faith. Galatians 2 and 15 says, We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. I don't care how you were able to keep the law and, and try and keep every facet of it. You cannot work your way into heaven is what it's saying. But by faith in Jesus Christ, by believing in the eternal one, by believing in the only begotten of the Father, by believing that Jesus is the Holy One, the Lamb of God, we will have been justified. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall not, no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found to be sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. For it is saying that if I am dead to the old law of Moses, and I accept and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, I am alive in him. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, not yet I but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ died in vain. See, if we could have made it in by the law of Moses, Christ would not have had to come and die for your sin and mine. But he had to come because, see, the law could not do what he could do. For you see, the law was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. Luke 24 and 44 says, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you. While I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled. See, we have to understand that the word of God, this holy word, the Bible, it has to come to complete fulfillment. Every dot, every tittle of the word is going to happen. And until that happens, Jesus won't come. But when it happens, he will be in the eastern sky looking for you and for me. But all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and that and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Jesus is saying it all has to come to pass because see, God's word does not return to him void. It does not go out and come back empty handed. It's going to go out and it's going to accomplish what he has purposed and set for it to do. Our late bishop, his last sermon said that the word has gone out and it has turned the corner and it is on its way back concerning you and concerning me. 
Then he opened their understanding. And I pray that God is opening all of our understandings this morning because we need to have a revelation and a deeper understanding of what this word is talking about. That he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. He is the icing on top of the cake. He is the completion of the whole matter. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, Thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning with Jerusalem. That is our call, saints. It doesn't matter whether you're standing behind the pulpit or where you're sitting in the audience of the Zoom this morning or out in the pews. We all have a call upon our life to tell somebody that Christ has come. He has fulfilled the Old Testament, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And that if you want to go to heaven, he is the only way that you can get there is through him. We are justified. Acts 13, 37 says, but he who God raised again and saw no corruption in him, be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. See, we have no other name that we can call upon. You know, some say there are many ways that we can get to heaven. But I'm here to tell you this morning, there's only one way. The Bible says in Acts that only one name is given in heaven and in earth and beneath the earth that we can call upon, and that name is Jesus. There is only one name that forgives sins, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law. For I'm here to tell you this morning that if you go out and you're speeding down the highway and you get a ticket and you go before the judge and the judge says, were you doing 70 in a 50 mile an hour zone? And you say, yes. The law determines that you are guilty. There is no uh, uh, innocence in your situation. That's what the law of Moses was doing. It was showing the faults and the convictions according to the law that there was no justification. There was no mercy allowed in the law. There was no grace given in the law. But through Jesus Christ and his grace and his mercy, he could forgive sin. And that we are justified from all things which could not be justified by the law of Moses. The law could not, con the law could not forgive sin, but it could only convict us of our wrongs. The law, the law requires justice. Not forgiveness, but justice. Redemption through the blood of Christ. Hebrews chapter 9 and 11. It says, but Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and a more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is to say not of this building for what man could not do God did through the body of the Lord Jesus Christ neither by the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place see goats and calves were not the ultimate sacrifice. They were just a covering for the time being, but they were not totally acceptable by the Lord. 
a more perfect sacrifice had to be given. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ. And the ashes of a heifer sprinkling, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. You know, no matter how we wash, we clean, or, 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 or how they utilize the blood of bulls and goats, there was no purified flesh in those days. And that unless the Lord Jesus had died and sanctified us through the blood, we would not be purified here this morning. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your consciousness from dead works to serve the living God? Because see, I'm here to tell you this morning that each and every one of us has got spots and blemishes. We are not perfect. It is only by the blood covering of the Lamb that has perfected us, purified us, and made us whole in the eyes of Father God. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, to purge your consciousness renewing of your mind from the dead works to serve the living God. I want to express that again. He is the living God. He lives yet today, seated on the right hand of the Father, soon to return for you and for me. For this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament that they which are called might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. See, there are a lot of things that we can inherit today, but I'm talking about the eternal inheritance. I'm talking about our gift after this life. I'm talking about the fact that your name and my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I would encourage you one day go and read the book of Revelations and see the picture of heaven as it's described. That's going to be your home and mine alike. But if that is the promise that he's talking about. But see, that promise only comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. For where there is a testament, there must also of the necessity be the death of the tester. For see, before somebody can allow you to inherit what was theirs and theirs only, you have to first die before they will have an opportunity to receive that inheritance. We heard this past week that the Queen of England passed away and that how her son is now the new king. Well, see, he could not take that position until she had passed away. He could not inherit what was hers unless she died first. And so the same with our Lord Jesus Christ. All the promises that he has made to us they can only be gifted to us after his death. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the tester liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without the blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept, to all the people according to the law. He took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people saying, this is the blood of the Testament which God hath enjoined unto you. See, I'm here to tell you this morning that without the blood, we have no relationship with Christ. Everything is 
sanctified in the blood of the Lamb. Saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness of sin. Me and you would not have the promise or the gift of eternal life without the remission of sin through the blood. It is therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Because what it's saying is that even though they use goats and bulls and lambs and, and all the animals of sacrifice, the more perfect sacrifice was the Lord Jesus Christ that fulfilled everything. Nor yet that we should offer himself up often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. See, they had to go to the temple and do it every year for the remission of sins. But see, with Christ, it is only one time. That one time covers it all. From the time that you receive him, Till the time that you die, it covers you. He does not have to continually go before the Father and make a blood sacrifice for you. He does not continually have to go and allow himself to be hung upon the cross and go through it over and over and over again. But it is one time that he did it. For as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Jesus is coming again, and he's coming back. For those that are covered by the blood, when you hear me pray my prayer on a Sunday morning, I plead the blood of the Lamb. Some might question why does he do that? Because see, he says right here, he's coming back looking for those that are without sin. The only way that you can be without sin is you got to be covered by the blood of the Lamb. The blood has to saturate you from head to toe. If you don't have the blood, he's not looking for you. He's only looking for those that are covered by the blood of the Lamb. I tell you again this morning as I conclude my message that he is the fulfillment of the law. The law could not be fulfilled unless Christ had did it himself. There was no other way. Man could not do it. Christ was the only one that could bridge the gap. You talk about going into heaven. There's only one way. And you got to walk across the Lord Jesus. Otherwise, you will not make it in to the kingdom of heaven. Christ came to fulfill the law. I pray that you got the word today. I pray that you understand that the Old Testament and the New Testament are like night and day. There is no separation between the two. We give God the glory and the praise. Thank you, Jesus. Lord.